I'm supposed to be going. I'm 101 years old, and I, I'm not supposed to be alive. But God let me here for a purpose. I had an experience. I have never met anyone that I had the same. We had a neighborhood barber shop. So I went over to get a haircut and uh, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and the barber was cutting my hair. And one barber said to the other one, said, hurry up and uh, finish up on that kid's hair, and let's go down on the railroad tracks and see if we can shoot some niggers. We opened the windows so we could hang out and look, and it, it smelled a, a terrible smell. I don't Did they burn bodies? We opened the first crate and looked down. And there were the bodies of three black men. We just lived down real quick and uh, proceeded to go over to the next crate, which is much larger, and opened it, and there was at least four bodies in that crate. They were all just piled in there. That night, just about dusk, up on Reservoir Hill, which was just south of the house, there's a great big cross burning. And all these people up there was it was a clan, that's what they were, because we could see them from our house. And they was burning this cross, and we could hear people crying and screaming. turn of the 20th century, Tulsa, Oklahoma, had the richest per capita wealth of any place on Earth. It was dubbed the oil capital of the world, the magic city, and the city of dreams. Among those who traveled to Tulsa was a young teacher named Mary Parrish. I came to Tulsa from Rochester, New York in 1918. I had heard of the town since girlhood and the many opportunities to make money. But I came because of the wonderful cooperation I observed among our people, especially among our businessmen and women. Every face seemed to wear a smile. After spending years of struggling and sacrifice, people had begun to look upon Tulsa as the Negro metropolis of the Southwest. Going north to Archer Street for two or more blocks, one could see nothing but Negro businesses. Going east, you would behold Greenwood Avenue, the Negro's Wall Street. There were homes of beauty and splendor, and the schools and churches were well attended. It was a city within a city, and some malicious newspapers took pride in referring to it as Little Africa. The readings from that time that were racist, inspired by racists, from the National Guard to the Klan controlling the legislature, when he spoke of blacks, blacks were to pull themselves up by the bootstraps. And they did. They did. The money in my community didn't turn over the traditional three or four times. It turned over eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 times. That was legitimate and illegitimate uh, monies to be made that fueled that economy. So my community was the Vegas of the 20. It was roaring. I can remember when I was a child that uh, the Ku Klux Klan, and there were probably, oh, in my opinion, uh, a couple thousand of them that would all robe up with their uh, hoods on and their gowns and and all and and uh, women and men and children. They had little children, maybe three feet high. They were all robed up and holding on to somebody's hand. They would march too. Usually, they would form up on about uh, uh, Seventh Street and uh, Main in there someplace, and then the police would clear all of the cars off of Main Street, and they would march and they would fill uh, the street from curb to curb, and it seemed like thousands of them. There might have been 2,000, I don't know, I don't remember. We used to go up and watch the Ku Klux Klan in their rally. 
on top of Standpipe Hill. And they were in their white robes and their pointed cap attire. And we used to just watch them. They had their torches burning and having a meeting. We knew not to get too close to them. The Klan was founded in 1865 to intimidate Southern blacks in the post-Civil War South. The reign of terror lasted 15 years, but as the movement died out, a legend, if not a lie, remained. Aging Civil War veterans told heroic stories of how the Klan had saved the South from domination by Negroes and Northern carpetbaggers. By 1915, there was no Klan in America. Three months later, an extraordinary event took place that would resurrect the Klan and its legend. The event was the release of a pioneering motion picture, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. It was based on a best-selling book called The Klansman. In many cases, Klan recruitment ads ran next to movie ads. Birth of a Nation played to 50 million people, approximately half of the population of the United States. It played across Oklahoma with a tremendous run in Tulsa. The Birth of a Nation stimulated the organization of the Ku Klux Klan, which in turn maintained a, a high profile and, a, and, and, uh, and stirred up uh, many uh, whites to uh, to acts of recrimination and of savagery uh, in this period. When you have thousands of white men coming back from World War I, bringing back Souvenir, Lewis, Spandau, and Browning submachine guns, and a variety of other weapons that they brought back from the battlefield. And then they can't find jobs. And the power structure within the city at that time, as was occurring in other cities, would enlist them in the Ku Klux Klan and blame their problems on Jews, African Americans, and Catholics. It was a simple answer to a complex problem for simple people. Meanwhile, they could stand in downtown Tulsa and look at the mansions in Little Africa, in the Black Wall Street, and seethe It was a typical Monday morning for a 19-year-old black man named Dick Rowland. He worked as a boot black in the downtown area. Because there was no restroom facilities, Rowland had permission to use the restroom on the top floor of the Drexel building. In order to reach the top floor, he had to use the elevator. Dick Rowland didn't look down when he went to get on the elevator, and therefore, because of the unevenness of the two floors, he stumbled and started falling, and he reached out to keep break his fall and touched his operator, and she hollered rape. And so they arrested, the police came and arrested Dick Rowland about 10 o'clock in the morning. And that afternoon, the Tribune came out and told what happened at the, in the Rue building. And uh, they, uh, after they told what was going to happen, then they said, it looks like there will be a lynching in Tulsa tonight. The newspaper described Roland as Diamond Dick and told of an attempted assault upon a poor orphan girl who worked as an elevator operator to pay her way through college. The article said that she had scratches on her hands and face. In fact, she was not an orphan. She had deserted her husband in Kansas City and had been served with divorce papers in Tulsa two months before. And she was neither scratched nor had torn clothes. The real incident isn't the incident in the elevator. 
The real incident is what happens over at the offices of the Tulsa Tribune, which was the city's daily afternoon newspaper. And we know there were a couple articles in it that talked about what happened at the Drexel. Uh, one was a front page article that said something like, nab Negro for attacking girl in elevator. But there was a second article, might have been an editorial, that we think was called, To Lynch Negro Tonight. We don't know really what it said, but we do know from white sources, from black sources, from um, government officials and others, that there was an article there uh, suggesting that a lynch mob should gather downtown and to lynch Dick Rowland. Talk of a lynching was prevalent throughout the city. And by evening, white crowds began to form around the courthouse. A burning cross was visible on Standpipe Hill, which overlooked North Tulsa and Greenwood. The sheriff took the elevator to the jail, located on the top floor of the courthouse, and set up a barricade. In Greenwood, it was believed that a lynching was imminent, and mob rule without legal consequences was not without precedent in Tulsa. A few months before, a lynch mob had taken accused killer one Ray Belton from the Tulsa jail. A mile-long procession of cars escorted him to a tree in a county road where he was lynched. Local police officers directed traffic. Three months later, in the town of Holdenville, 70 miles away, a white mob took a black man from the county jail, hanged him from a telephone pole, and riddled his body with bullets. He was accused of attacking a white woman. In Wagner, 30 miles from Tulsa, another lynching took place. A white man down in Wagner, Oklahoma, had him ask a colored girl for sex. And she told him her price. He had sex and he didn't want to pay her. He didn't pay her. She took out a knife and cut his throat and killed him. So they arrested her. They lynched her. And then they drug her body up and down the main street of Wagner, Oklahoma. And the Negroes in the community had decided there will not be a lynching in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, it is not considered a crime for a man to kill a Negro. In recent years, there have been many lynchings in Oklahoma. There is yet to be chronicled the instance where any individual has paid a legal penalty or where an officer has been removed from office for failure to protect the life of his prisoners from criminal violence. It is perfectly safe at any time and at any place for any considerable number of men together to take a prisoner from the hands of an officer and inflict the penalty of death. Harlow's Weekly, June 1921. Most of the news that people received came from their newspapers. Uh, it's incredible to, to look at the content of those newspapers and realize that uh, it was a constant barrage of uh, articles appearing concerning lynchings of black people. Uh, this was over and over and, and over again. In fact, uh, two black people a week were being lynched in America at this time. The evening being a pleasant one, my little girl had not retired but was watching the people from the window. Occasionally she would call to me, Mother, look at the cars full of people. I would reply, Baby, do not disturb me when I read. Finally, she said, Mother, I see men with guns. Then I ran to the window and looked out. There, I saw many people gathered in little squads, talking excitedly. Going downstairs to the street, I was told of the threatened lynching and that some of our group were going to give added protection to the boy. I am told that this little bunch of black men marched up to the jail where there were already over 500 white men gathered and that this number was soon swelled to over 1,000. Someone fired a stray shot and to use the expression of General Grant, all hell broke loose. The first one was shot on Main Street, right in front of the biggest picture palace. 
His falling brought the crowd to a halt. It just stood and looked at him. Three or four ambulances clanged down to the place. But the crowd turned on them and showed their guns. One said, don't touch the blankety blank. The ambulance workers didn't quite know what to do, so they turned off their engines and just stood there, blocking the street. Then there was a whoop a block away. Some of the Negroes had tried to organize and get their friend. The crowd surged forward, trampling the man on the sidewalk who was about dead. He lay writhing on the sidewalk under a billboard from which smiled winsomely the face of Mary Pickford, America's sweetheart. The atmosphere was festive as the police department commissioned 500 special deputies. These could best be described as clan deputies. The only prerequisite was that they must be white. Most were not even asked their names or addresses. One black man was erroneously sworn in. It occurred to me I could get sworn in as one of the special deputies. It was easy. My skin was apparently white, and that was enough. After some 50 or 60 of us had been sworn in, a villainous-looking man remarked casually, even with a note of happiness in his voice, now you can go out and shoot any nigger you see and the law will be behind you. The Ku Klux Klan mob, having largely been made up of veterans, began to militarily organize themselves. And they divided down into squads and ran a skirmish line along Archer. After watching the men unload on First Street, where we could see them from our windows, we heard such a buzz and noise that on running to the door to get a better view of what was going on, the sights our eyes beheld made our poor hearts stand still for a moment. There was a great shadow in the sky, and upon a second look, we discerned that this cloud was caused by fast approaching airplanes. It then dawned upon us that the enemy had organized in the night and was invading our district, the same as the Germans invaded France and Belgium. Looking south out of the window of what then was the woods building, we saw carloads of men with rifles unloading up near First Street. Then the truth dawned upon us that our men were fighting in vain to hold their dear Greenwood, Mary Parish. As daylight approached, the whites were given a signal by a whistle, and the outrage took place. All of this happened while innocent Negroes were slumbering and did not have the least idea they would fall victims to such brutality. At the sound of another whistle, more than a dozen aeroplanes went up and began to drop turpentine balls on the Negro residences, while 5,000 whites with machine guns and other deadly weapons fired in all directions. Negro men, women, and children began making haste to flee to safety but to no avail, as they were met on all sides with volleys of shot. They were killed in great numbers as they ran, trying to flee to safety. Torchlights were used to burn up the Negro settlement. And in the meantime, they used large trucks loading up pianos, victrolas, and other articles that were left in the Negro homes. A.H. backed trucks up to the vacated Negro homes and loaded everything movable and of value. Every bit of money found on their persons was taken. Masonic rings were removed from the fingers, watches and chains from their persons. In fact, everything of a material nature preparatory to the cruel initiation which had not yet ended was taken from them. And so, penniless, in a destitute condition. They were corralled first one place and another. G.A. Gray. 
once they framed that skirmish line, they marched into the north side of the downtown area, and they shot everybody they could find. They burned every home, but not before looting it first. They burned every business. They burned every car. They burned everything, systematically, block by block, house by house. They went all the way through the city. At the same time, the telephone lines were cut, the telegraph lines were cut, and the railroad leading into Tulsa was uh, blockaded. There was no way to communicate what was going on in Tulsa with anybody else because it was very easy to s cut the city off. And that's exactly what the mayor and the city commission and the Ku Klux Klan wanted because it gave them the opportunity to clean out the entire African-American area of the city without being interfered with. And they were doing it very systematically. The mob would not permit firemen to battle the blaze. They looted stores and pawn shops for guns and ammunition, but they also took walking suits, tools, tires, and jewelry. Carloads of whites would occasionally venture into the black area, shooting indiscriminately. And I said to my mother, I said, Mama, we better get out of here, because my wife is are really tearing up Jack. They're, out there, they're burning into places and b killing people, and they're gonna kill us. And we were sitting out and the people kept running. They just opened the gate and come on through and go on out the back. And Mama said, what are you people running for? And you just, you don't know where you're going? They said, no, they're killing over there and burning the town down over the hill. The technique varied with different groups in the mob. But the general procedure was to go up to a door and put a gun against the lock and blow it off. The flimsy doors would have smashed easily enough, but this was gun night. Once inside the cabin, everything breakable was broken. Trunks and bureau drawers torn open, pictures and telephones wrenched off the walls and trampled. They didn't often find anyone in the houses, because by now the blacks were scurrying ahead of the horror out into the country beyond the town. But sometimes they did find someone with whom they dealt. When they had smashed enough, they scattered around a little kerosene and threw some lighted matches into the mess. If this particular cabin didn't burn well, it would be reset presently by the blaze of the one next door. The houses the mob set fire to without breaking in first were really the most unlucky. Because sometimes there were people in them, panic paralyzed, people who didn't realize with all the noise and fright that the house was on fire, not until it was too late to get out. There's a black veteran who could not believe that this mob would kill a veteran. And as the mob got closer to his home, he put on his uniform and stood out in the front yard at attention. The mob killed him and burned his house. In a frenzy of destruction and violence, black corpses were tied to the bumpers of automobiles and dragged through the Greenwood district while bullets were fired into their bodies. Some bodies were hoisted on telephone poles. An elderly black couple was murdered returning from church. A white man mistaken for a black man was summarily executed. Enterprising entrepreneurs snapped pictures of the grisly scenes to be sold later as postcards entitled, Running the Negro Out of Tulsa. Death had come easily. Even a defiant glance at a camera could result in instant execution. America's most renowned black surgeon and past president of the State Medical Association, Dr. A.C. Jackson, was shot by a white teenager as he held his hands above his head. He was not killed instantly. His body was thrown into a truck and he was dumped at the convention center where after hours of suffering without medical attention, he bled to death began to drive slowly along our street. Cars driven by the sort of men who wear their caps backward, visors down their necks, probably not to interfere with their rifle gaze. And the niggers in these houses, they would shout. The gaping children were called in hastily from the curbs. Didn't seem a very educational sight, not a very safe one. After the first car or so, people sent their servants down in the cellar or up in the attic and waited. Then the horde of ruffians went down Detroit, 
looting those beautiful homes of everything valuable and burning them. The machine guns just shattered the walls of the homes. The fire department came out and protected the white homes on the west side of the street. Men and women with torches and women with shopping bags continued their looting and burning of Negro homes. My mother saw some white people coming toward our house and she put us under the bed and she saw them coming. My oldest sister got under first, and then it was my younger sister, and then my brother, and then they pulled me under the bed. Now, by this time, the people were coming in. They had torches in their hands. We could see their feet from under the bed. And one stepped on my finger, and as I went to scream, my sister put her hand over my mouth. I don't know what, I don't know today as to what would have happened had they heard us under the bed. But they came in and they set the curtains on fire and set our house on fire and then went out the door and my mother got us from under the bed. I will always remember that on this day I live. There was the son of a cook in our street. Around 9 o'clock, the man he worked for came and asked for Hattie. He was in a car with some other men. It seemed that the boy thought he ought to get to his job. Before he knew it, he'd been caught in the fighting around the railroad tracks and crawled under a freight car to hide. Someone went in after him and shot him with a pistol. Now that things were quieting down a little, he was lying in the town hall where the militia were assembling the blacks. But his employer was afraid he wouldn't live many more hours. If Hattie wanted to see the boy, he said, he would take her down and look out for her. But she was afraid to go. He couldn't blame her, really. Some of the house Negroes who had allowed themselves to be put in those wandering cars and escorted to the safety of the town hall had been shot at as they drove through the streets. It wasn't the ride an old woman wanted to undertake, even to see her boy alive. The boy's boss understood. He went back himself and got a doctor and stayed with the boy till he died. The burning of that flesh, you could smell. It was horrible. And then those those crosses burning up on the, on the reservoir hill, which up at that time, there's no homes up there. About 7 o'clock, the whites, or home guards, came for the men. Then they took the women and children, promising them safety. After they had the homes vacated, one bunch of whites would come in and loot. Even women with shopping bags would come in, open drawers, take every kind of finery from clothing to silverware and jewelry. Men were carrying out the furniture, cursing as they did so, saying, these damn Negroes have better things than a lot of us white people. I stayed until my home was caught on fire. Then I ran to the hillside where there were throngs of white people, women, men and children, even babies, watching and taking snapshots of the proceedings of the mob. Some remark that the city ought to be sued for selling them damn niggas' property so close to the city. <sighs> One woman noticed the First Baptist Church, which is a beautiful structure located near a white residential district. And she said, Yonder is a nigger church. Why ain't they burning it? The reply was, It's in a white district. I saw the bombs dropping and the church explode. The six airplanes that I saw flying over Stand Pipe Hill and dropping the bombs on Mount Zion Baptist Church. Burned that church and it just completed 40 days. And it was burned. The white church on 4th Street was a frame 
church. Our church was better than the white people's church. This church was only 40 days old. It was truly a symbol of black prosperity, and it was burnt to the ground, allegedly because ammunition was being stored in the basement or some such nonsense. People were seen to flee from their burning homes, some with babes in their arms and leading, crying, excited children by the hand, others old and feeble, all fleeing to safety. Yet seemingly, I could not leave. I walked as one in a, a horrible dream. By this time, my little girl was up and dressed, but I made her lie down on the dufo in order that the bullets must penetrate it before reaching her. By this time, a machine gun had been installed in the granary and was raining down bullets on our section. Mary Parrish. The most horrible scenes of this occurrence was to see women dragging their children while running to safety and the dirty white rascals firing at them as they ran. Some of them were pursued for more than 12 or 15 miles, and some never returned. Negro hospitals with numbers of sick were burned, and many people perished in the flames, not being able to get to a place of safety. Women were chased from their homes, naked, with clothes in their hands, and volleys of shots fired at them as they were fleeing. Some with babies in their arms, A.H. As I neared Standpipe Hill, I could see homes on Eastern and Detroit burning, and also discovered that the enemy had located on the hill and that our district was entirely surrounded. We thought that we were leaving the firing behind, but found that our danger was increasing, for a machine gun was located on the hillside. They came over and they had machine guns up there and he was manning the machine gun and he and his companions, they were shooting down on the people. They had machine guns up there, shooting at us. My husband and I, when we came out, they were shooting at us. We didn't get any shots. They killed one of our fine doctors. I can never forget a family who started out and had the misfortune to lose one wheel off their wagon and therefore had to get out and walk. In that numbers was a mother and a father with a six-month-old infant. Oh, such a fine and healthy baby. The father would run along and carry it a while when the mother would take it until she was tired out. When they both were just about exhausted, the father cried out, Will someone help us? Mrs. Rosa Davis Skinner, who told about the night of the riot when it broke out on Greenwood, she was asleep. Her husband awakened her and said, wife, come on, there's a riot on. And they left fleeing, she in her gown and house shoes, and joined with the neighbor next door who had had a stillborn baby early in the day. They were going to bury the baby the next day, put it in a little shoe box. And uh, Mrs. Uh, Skinner said that while they were running, mobsters shooting at them, bullets zinging at them, people shoving and bumping into each other. This lady dropped that little shoebox, and she got down on her hands and knees to try to find it, and she couldn't. And her husband just dragged her away, said, you're going to get killed, we've got to go. And he dragged her away, and they never found that little baby. This lady wept when she told me that. She was 98 years old, and that had been 75 years earlier, and she wept and said, I often wonder what happened to that poor little baby. We both wept. We came out after several shots were fired into the house by the mob. Two or three whites thrust guns in each man's face and side and took him downstairs. As I neared the bottom of the steps, I was met by a man who very unkindly treated me. Seeing a man with hands raised, he came up to the blind side and struck me in the jaw after which I was questioned and my money taken. The worst thing of all was being humiliated before little boys between the ages of 12 and 16 years, knowing these youngsters would grow up to try the same thing when they matured that others tried, but with less success, I am hoping. J.C. Latimer. One of the classic photos that comes from the, the riot is that of a 
perhaps 15, 16 year old, uh, probably would be referred to in those days as a hooligan, uh, strutting proudly in front of the camera with the burning and, and terrible circumstances in the background, uh, puffing a cigar, carrying not one but two firearms. As you look at that picture and you think of what's going on around him, uh, you, you can't help but hope that uh, he, he will be taught a lesson about life's justice. The certainty that many blacks had that whites took their furniture, took their clothes, took various other personal possessions and, uh, and used them and then having taken those things for their use, then they burned and bombed the, the black part of town. It was a surprise. And they came over here and burned our homes, stole our clothes. Some of our people had to take their own clothes off of white people right here in Tulsa. The heavy air was soaked with the scent of honeysuckle, as extravagant and lavishly unreal as was the gunfire. We've been in this prairie country a year. It proved always surprising. An acrid under hint of burnt powder began to cut through the perfume of the flowers. Tulsa's newspapers described the event as a military adventure. The black people defending their homes were described as the enemy. Gun-toting white men were referred to as riflemen or soldiers, and blacks were termed snipers. The mob, it was called a volunteer army. Blacks with guns were called a mob. Marauding whites were called patrols. At approximately 9.15 a.m., the National Guard troops from Oklahoma City arrived by train. In all my experience, I've never witnessed such a scene. 25,000 whites armed to the teeth were ranging through the city in utter and ruthless defiance of every concept of law and righteousness. Motor cars bristling with guns swept through the city, their occupants firing at will. General Charles Barrett. Fanny was our laundress. She lived in Greenwood with an ancient uncle who'd been the messenger in a bank for 20 years. They knew there was trouble, of course, but the mob had missed them so far. Uncle Zack had never been late to the bank, and he trusted white folks. He thought maybe if he put on his uniform and they saw it, he put it on and started out to work. Someone shot him at the corner. Fanny could see him lying there. She didn't dare go out and get him. The mob was so close. As North Tulsa burned and its citizens murdered and arrested, the guard set up camp and began to prepare a breakfast. When a local citizen urged the commander to take some action to save property and lives, he was arrested. Martial law was declared at 11.29 a.m. The Ku Klux Klan, realizing that they were now up against an organized military force, uh, withdrew out of the area and dissipated back into their neighborhoods. It was very much like a guerrilla operation where you could no longer tell who were the combatants because they weren't wearing uniforms and now they were part of the civilian society. Detention areas were set up at a local park, the convention center, and the baseball park. Every African American had to fill out and carry an identification card, which had to be signed by a white employer and approved by a local official. If approved, the prisoner was given a ribbon that he or she had to wear. The ribbon read, police protection. Failure to wear the ribbon resulted in immediate arrest and confinement. A black person could only be released from detention if he or she was vouched for by a white person. About 11 o'clock, they took my invalid mother, supposedly, to the convention hall for safety. Upon entering the convention hall, I failed to find my mother, so I went in search of her. I found my mother at North Methodist Church. I tried to get a pass to send her away, but failed to get one. 
she remained unconscious for two weeks and passed away. I feel that this damnable affair has ruined us all. Carrie Kenlong. We hadn't heard from my father. And although I was six years old, I remember quite well the anxiety that all of us felt. Where's my daddy? Where's my husband, mother would say, and, and so forth. And so we, 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 had a, we had a period of agonizing waiting, and that was an awful, awful experience. And it was several days, I don't know how many, in the absence of, uh, of telephones and radios and that sort of thing, we didn't know. We had no way of finding out. And so after what seemed to have been an endless period of time, we received a letter from my father saying that he was all right. He, was, he told us that he had been in detention at Convention Hall and that, uh, and that he had nothing except what he had on his back. The prisoners, mostly women and children and the elderly, were marched through the streets with their hands above their heads. The stress, heat, and exertion resulted in the rise of premature births. Before the day was over, every black person in the city was killed, wounded, arrested, or placed in confinement. class whites actually hid many of the African-American domestics who worked for them at great jeopardy to them. If a white family during that riot had been found to have hidden an African-American, at the very least the white family would have been lashed. Terrified black people fled the city to other communities. After reaching this home, the crowd thrown there was too large to supply them out of a pail, so a wash tub was drafted in the service and pride cast to the wind. We were so famished and our lips parched, the children crying for a drink, that this was the best tasting water we could remember of having tasted. Mary Parish. We had an engineer for the Frisco live behind us, and he would give us a day by day how these people were walking down the railroad coming toward Claremore, and then coming toward Chelsea, then coming toward Benita. They were just like the rest of the hobos that came to our back door. And they had lots of them with baby buggies, no men at all, all women, lots of old women. On and on we went toward the section line, the crowd growing larger and larger. The question on every lip when a newcomer from town would arrive was, how far had they burned when you left town? After we had gone several miles, we began to see automobile loads of men with guns going east ahead of us. We wondered where they were going, but we were not destined to wander for long. But as we neared the aviation fields, we saw their destination. The planes were out of the sheds, all in readiness for flying, and these men with high-powered rifles were getting into them. As we went further, we saw several men leaving the fields, going to the house, returning with guns, and heading towards Tulsa. After we had traveled many miles into the country and was turning to find our way to Claremont, we looked 
looked up the road and saw Ray's lady coming toward us. My lady friend and I went to meet her. She advised us to not to try to pass through a little adjoining town. There was a group of black people that were trying to escape, women, children, and old people in Blackwood were trying to escape from this thing. We're going up the railroad tracks that went by um, that hill up there in Collinsville. So that a group of black people came by that hill trying to escape, and somebody thought that they were being attacked and invaded, and apparently they began shooting and killed a whole bunch of those poor folks. The airplanes continued to watch over the fleeing people like great birds of prey watching for a victim. Although we were over 13 miles from Tulsa, we could, at about 10 p.m., see the smoke rising from the ruins. The next morning, we were informed that Greenwood had been burned. It was then that I shed my first tears. A truck arrived for us about 9 o'clock, and we started for Tulsa. We did not enter through our section, but we were brought through the white section. Can you imagine the humiliation of coming in like that, with many doors thrown open, watching you pass? Some with pity, and others with smiles. And when a bunch of the colored folks that they were marching down Elgin, uh, I would see them coming and I'd kept my BB gun under the front porch at that time and I would run down and grab the BB gun and stick the barrel out through the lattice work and, and uh, pop the National Guardsmen. Of course, they'd bounce like this and look around and of course I was careful enough that I wasn't going to hit anybody in the head or anything like that. These two brothers, the youngest two, they were kind of smart alecky and they thought, you know, they'd stir up a riot or stink or something. And I can remember standing behind them and crying with my dad just all of them backhanded one of them in the back of the head because he was going to take a gun. And he wasn't going to shoot at the people, he was going to shoot up in the air. And I remember my crying and saying, begging him not to do it. And my dad, you know, told him he wasn't going to do that to those people. They was only trying to get away themselves. Soon we reached the black district, which was so beautiful and prosperous looking when we left. There we found to be piles of bricks, ashes, and twisted iron representing years of toil and savings. We were horror-stricken, but could not shed a tear. At that hour, we mistrusted every person having a white face or blue eyes. which he had built a crate on the back to carry the greyhounds in. And uh, he took that crate off when he left the greyhounds, wherever it was, he left them at some kennel or other, and just had a plain pickup truck. And they, the police saw his truck and they told him to call bodies, dead bodies, to wherever they were taking them. I don't know where they took them. And I saw these two truckloads of bodies, dead bodies, 
uh, they were Negroes, with their arms and legs sticking out, you know, through the slats, and it frightened me so, but I kept thinking of them in terms of dolls. On the top of the very, very top of the uh, pile of bodies was a little boy just about my age, and his head flipped over like that, and he looked at me, his mouth was open, and he was in a brown pants and a blue shirt, and uh, just looked like he'd been frightened to death. And uh, so I screamed that Jesse came in, but by that time, the two trucks had passed on. After black Tulsans were incarcerated, curiosity seekers, looters, and souvenir hunters casually strolled through the smoldering ruins. Well, I had a friend, a, a girlfriend, and uh, one day after the riot had uh, uh, subsided, or possibly was still, they, they were still uh, protecting and giving the colored people sanctuary, well, she came out and she had a, a package of spearmint gum, Wrigley spearmint gum. And uh, perhaps there were 40 or 50 packages of gum in the little square box, about so square and maybe two inches deep and she was passing the gum out to all the kids in the neighborhood. And of course, we asked, where did you get it? And she said, oh, daddy got it over in Nigger Town, which uh, was a clear indication that, that, that white people looted the colored people over in the Greenwood area. When they doubted about it, of course, we didn't think anything about it. We, we just took the gum and chewed it. Martial law was less than benevolent. Field Order Number 3 prohibited the holding of funerals at churches. But in reality, this prohibition pertained to black funerals only. White funerals went on as usual. Overnight, these people had nothing. And uh, they had to start over again. A person who had office and clients or patients or customers had nothing. And the people that were his clients and or their clients and patients and customers had nothing. And so it was extremely difficult for them to get on their feet. It was, it was pathetic when you think about it. Out of all of our seven years, as you know, I said, my husband and I lost more than anybody in North Tulsa because we lost seven years of our earning in, in one night. And we had altogether 10 different business places for rent. Today, I'm paying rent. Few black Tulsans had insurance. And those who did had clauses which voided the policies in case of a riot. Those making a claim had to prove that the city or state government was negligent in protecting their property. An impossible burden because the victors had already begun to rewrite the history and insulate themselves from blame. An all-white grand jury placed the blame for the Holocaust squarely on the black population. Also blaming the black population was Tulsa's white churches, the Chamber of Commerce, and of course Tulsa's white newspapers. In this old nigger town, there are a lot of bad niggers, and a bad nigger is about the lowest thing that walks on two feet. Give a bad nigger his booze, his dope, and a gun, and he thinks he can shoot up the world. And all these four things were to be found in nigger town. Booze, dope, bad niggers, and guns. The Tulsa Tribune makes no apology to the police commissioners or to the mayor of this city for having pled with them to clean up the cesspools in this city. The Tulsa Tribune, June 4th, 1921. Incredibly, after all the yellow journalism that had been published at the time about the incident and prior to the incident by white-owned newspapers, the one indictment returned by the grand jury of a newspaper was against Mr. A.J. Smitherman, one of the most influential black citizens in Tulsa, owner of a black newspaper. And that comes after his offices, his newspaper offices, were destroyed and burned in the riot. He left Tulsa and never returned. 
Cities across America offered assistance, but Tulsa officials turned down all the offers under the guise of handling the problems themselves. From a 10 room and basement modern brick home, I'm now living in my coal barn. From a five chair enamel barber shop with four workmen and a porter to a razor strap and a folding chair on the sidewalk. Didn't have one thing left and never received a dime. Up until this day, they never. And it ought to be added in order that they ought to be made pay. Even the children have suffered. Our children have suffered because their parents lost everything they had, and the children weren't able to, to get along, and they were doing fine. The Red Cross took donations and performed an admirable job with little help from government officials. Returning to the Red Cross headquarters, I found rows of women, men, and children waiting their turn to receive clothing, such as was obtainable. And the thing that I could not understand was why these innocent people who were helpless as babes were placed under guard. Nevertheless, heavily armed guards were all around the building. Some were kind and manly. Others were beasts dressed in uniforms. I went upstairs into the clothing room in a quest of a change of clothing for my little girl. Having worked hard always for an independent living, thereby being able to have what I wanted within reason, this was wormwood and gall to me. Just to be standing around waiting to get a change of secondhand clothing. But what could I do? What we had on was soil. They being all we had, and I was not yet permitted to go to town and purchase more. The primary rooms of the Booker Washington School were converted into an emergency hospital. I can never erase the sights of my first visit to the hospital. There were men wounded in every conceivable way, like soldiers after a big battle. Some with amputated limbs, burned faces, others minors and I, or with heads bandaged. There were women who were nervous wrecks in some confinement cases. One mother was thoughtless as to burden her infant for life with the name of June Riot. Mary Jones Parish. Fourteen hundred claims were made by black citizens for their losses during this riot. Not one, not a single claim was ever paid any of these black citizens for their losses. But there was a claim paid to a white store owner for his loss of guns and ammunition that was used by white rioters. Now you have to ask yourself, what's wrong with this picture? Many humorous instances might be cited of claims presented by innocent bystanders for the payment of doctor bills. Now all such claims were originally investigated and many were turned down for the reasons that it could not be shown that the wounded parties were innocent bystanders or persons in the employ of the city or the county for guard purposes. Quite early in the fall, a claim for a $55,000 doctor bill was presented by a young white man for a gunshot wound treatment. The claim was <laughs> of the innocent bystander kind. After lengthy explanation on the part of the claimant as to how the injury was incurred, but after his admission that he was not employed by the city or county, the Red Cross record keeper confronted him with a full-size photograph of the same young man in the middle of the riot district with a shotgun over his shoulder and a high-powered rifle in his hand. Although he did not deny the identity, he has not been seen at the Red Cross office since. After this experience, no further claims have been made by innocent bystanders. Mr. Maurice Willows, director of Red Cross Relief. A tent city was constructed to house refugees. 
Embarrassed city officials, white newspapers, the clergy, and the Chamber of Commerce perpetuated the myth that white Tulsa had an outpouring of aid into the devastated black community. In fact, just the opposite was true. With homes looted, homes and stores burned to ashes, with sick, aged, and enfeebled carried out or left to perish in the flames, mothers giving birth to children in the open, herded, guarded, and corralled like prisoners of war. And before the smoke of a thousand homes had blown away, the trembling and homeless learned that the city fathers had passed an ordinance making it forever impossible for them in their destitute condition to go back and rebuild on their home place. G.A. Gregg. The city council or commissioners uh, passed an ordinance that there could be no construction in the city of Tulsa that was not fireproof. Now, with people absolutely without any resources, uh, it was impossible for them to conform to any requirement that they rebuild only fireproof structures. And my father said, you build if they arrest you, I'll get you out of jail. You can go on, go on building. And my dad had challenged the constitutionality of that, or that city ordinance. And the Supreme Court of the state of Oklahoma declared that ordinance unconstitutional as being a frivolous piece of legislation designed to keep blacks down. With their hearts bleeding, their homes, and all of the relics that make the memories of life's past sustaining with shocking realization that their families are broken and scattered in fear and mob with trembly weak hungry and hungerless bodies compelled to be in the stalls of the fairgrounds under a heavy cruel guard who greets them with harsh orders and vulgar language while suffering all this and more the mayor, commissioners, the real estate exchange, the welfare board are like those who crucified Christ, yeah. casted lots for the Negro's hard-earned land. G.A. Gray. Not only was the area declared a fire zone, which effectively uh, was designed to prevent it from being rebuilt, but then amazingly, uh, just incredibly, the city fathers put the land up for sale. Through the Reconstruction Committee appointed by the mayor and city commissioners June 14th, Tulsa extends a welcoming hand to wholesale houses and industrial plants, which are to be located on the trackage property in Little Africa, swept by fire, and which is now within the city fire limits, restricted to the erection of fire-resisting buildings. The committee also expressed a sentiment in favor of using a part of the burned area for a union station whenever such a project is ready for consideration by the railroads entering Tulsa. Tulsa World, June 15, 1921. In order to help people get in touch with their loved ones who were anxious to hear from them, Mr. Theo Bowman, the Oklahoma son, succeeded in getting out a little daily paper. Each day, he would publish these lists. Each day, people sat under the tent and watched for these lists, as well as the lists of dead in the big dailies. The dead were so quickly disposed of on that night and day until it was impossible to ever get an exact record of the dead and wounded. A cousin and I decided to go visit somebody and we passed down by the cemetery there at Lemons and Lewis, the old Oakland Cemetery. And as we went down the Lemons Street, why, we saw a bunch of men working, digging a pit, evidently, and we noticed a bunch of wooden crates lying around. So we were very curious about it, so we went in to have a look. And uh, we walked up to the first crate, and we were unnoticed by the men. And uh, we opened the first crate, looked in, and there were the bodies of three black men. 
we shut the lid down real quick and uh, proceeded to go over to the next crate, which is much larger, and opened it, and there was at least four bodies in that crate. They were all just piled in there. And about that time, the men noticed us and ran us out. The Red Cross estimated that 300 people were killed. The official death toll was placed at 36. Terrified witnesses told of bodies being disposed of at city incinerators, the Arkansas River, and local strip mining pits. When one witness was asked about the difference between the Red Cross totals and the city's official count, the reply was, there is no statute of limitations on murder. I had a friend of mine named Bill Wilbanks, who at that time was a captain in the Tulsa Police Department. And he called me and he said, um, would you come down to the police academy? I'd like to show you something. And I said, sure. And I dropped down to the police academy, and he was cleaning out some files. And underneath the bottom drawer were several pieces of paper that were clipped together with a rusty paper clip. With the rusted paper clip rusted to the paper, the papers had not been separated in years. What you had was a description of casualties that were what we later refer to as KIAs. And there were 300 plus on these six pieces of paper. There is absolutely no question in my mind that of all of the horrible race riots we've had in this country, Watts, 1968, Detroit, 1942, none of them have even approached the casualty levels of Tulsa of 1921. There was definitely a cover-up or a suppression of the material. Uh, for example, the article, the inflammatory article, to lynch Negro tonight has vanished, disappeared. Uh, it's not in the Oklahoma Historical Society. It's not in the newspaper archives. In the microfilming of the Tulsa Tribune records, it's been excised and can't be found. Now, some people would and have said down through the years, uh, why research this? Why bring it up? Uh, it can do no good. And in fact, there has been uh, uh, some uh, threats of real danger and possible harm uh, to those who would explore the situation and would look at it again. I'm not so sure that in many minds, black and white, that the cover-up was helpful in, in, in get, gaining some equilibrium. Whites need to be comforted that they had done no wrong. Blacks need to be comforted that no new wrong could happen to them. So but th those two things companion themselves created this conspiracy of silence. 1,200 homes were destroyed. Another 320 were looted. Over 4,000 people were left homeless and over 1,000 spent the harsh winter in tents. No one was ever imprisoned for his or her actions. Charges against Dick Rowland were dismissed. No one knows what happened to him or the elevator operator. We travel to Europe and see the ruins of Athens and the ruins of Rome. My, my mind went back to the ruins of Tulsa, which were somewhat reminiscent to me then when I was traveling. Other rooms of the ruins of Rome and Athens and other places in Europe. Yeah. A big, beautiful Christmas tree was placed in front of the Red Cross Relief Headquarters. Now imagine, if you can, this huge tree brightly standing in the middle of a district which had once been comfortable but now filled with little ones and little two-room wooden shacks. Everywhere, large piles of brick and stone, twisted metal and debris, reminding one of the horrible fact of last June. 
For the first time in their lives, the Negro children of the devastated district, these hundreds of little folks, were without their former comfortable homes. The resources of their parents had been reduced to a point where Christmas couldn't mean much to them. After dusk on Christmas Eve, a chorus of 2,200 voices sang their Christmas carols and the typical Negro melodies. Coming from the throats of these people reverberated through the night air and attracted most of the crowd gathered in the business section over on Greenwood Street. Whole families were there, men, women, children. It seemed as though the whole Negro population could resist this chance to sing. Never have I witnessed more spontaneous outbursts of Christmas fervor than on this occasion. The crowning sentiment of the celebration was in a speech made by one of the leaders who said, let us always remember the old Negro tradition. There's no room in our hearts for hatred. This occasion furnished what was termed as the greatest night in the history of the Tulsa Negroes. Mr. Maurice Willows, director of Red Cross Relief, Christmas, 1921. Tulsa need not feel that, you know, it's irredeemable. That was just a mindset at that time. What we hope to learn from this ride study is the danger of having a mindset that would exclude someone based on race, religion, gender, or something. So we hope that we learn some lessons from this. Some of our group feel their superiority over those less fortunate. But when a supreme test, like the Tulsa disaster comes, it serves to remind us that we are all one race. That human fiends, like those who had full sway on June 1st, have no respect of person. Every Negro was accorded the same treatment, regardless of his education or other advantages. A Negro was a Negro on that day and was forced to march for blocks with his hands up that day. It should teach us to remember that we cannot rise higher than our weakest brother. My name is Mary Parrish.
what you're about to witness will astound you. It will most likely affect you very deeply, no matter what race, creed, or color you are. And just maybe, this film will make us all take a second look at our fellow man and not hate him or her because of the color of their skin. This is an actual account of the worst race riot in United States history. It's not a pretty story, and it's not being told for its shock value or to reopen old wounds. This material is presented because it happened 70 years ago to another generation whose story is pertinent to this contemporary generation. The true facts were completely covered up and kept from the American public. The date was June the 2nd, 1921. The place, Tulsa, Oklahoma. After the bombing, the Tulsa World headline read, Dead, estimated at 100, city quiet. One of the bloodiest race riots in the nation's non-military history had begun. The spark for the tender was ignited on Monday, May 30th, 1921. Here's the story. early 1900s, Archer Street was intentionally designed to divide the city's north from the south side of Tulsa. Blacks were forced to remain on the north side, and whites enjoyed their separatism on the south side. Laws were passed to make sure that whites and blacks remained separated. Anybody who wishes for the good old days probably doesn't remember what the good old days were really like. Because in 1921, the nation suffered from coast to coast from hate, and discrimination, and arrogance. And those were probably the underlying reasons. They manifested themselves in organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. But you can't blame the riot on one or two or three specific incidents. The environment is what caused it. You have to keep in mind that in 1921, the majority of the Oklahoma legislature were Klansmen. Almost every city and county official in Tulsa County, Oklahoma, was elected with either support of the Klan or they were Klansmen themselves. In those days, the Klan would have parades in downtown Tulsa, wearing their white sheets and their pointy little hats to fit their pointy little heads, that would last four to five hours in length. Now visualize the number of people that were involved in a parade that would last four to five hours. And all these people came from Tulsa. 
when you had a parade in Tulsa, a lot of people come in from other counties. But you also have to remember that uh, 1925, there were five million card-carrying Ku Klux Klansmen in this country. So what was going on in Tulsa was probably the same thing that was going on in an awful lot of other cities. And if the riot hadn't happened in Tulsa, it probably would have happened someplace else. The difference between Tulsa and some other city is that we know how bad it got and where we've gone since then has been a mark of our progress. As I sit here, I wonder, with blacks fighting for equal rights and integration in other parts of the United States at that time, was it really a good idea for blacks living in Greenwood to integrate? But what happened by 1921 was not so much what happened on the black side, but what happened on the white side of the city. Because you had a lot of veterans coming back from Bellow Wood and Chateau Terry and the Argonne Forest, and they couldn't find jobs. And a lot of these were white, uneducated, lower economic class folks. And when they came back to Tulsa, the Klan milked that resentment that they held for those black, prosperous businessmen. And the Klan did the same to them that the Nazis did in Germany in 1933. As a matter of fact, it's kind of interesting. You can make an analogy here that uh, is historically profound. We had a microcosmic experience with the Nazis. The Nazis in Germany in 1933 blamed the Jews, and they persecuted the Jews, and they segregated the Jews, and they created ghettos for the Jews. And that's how they built their power, but they built their power on the disenfranchised and the disenchanted Germans. Well, the Nazis took over an entire country. The Ku Klux Klan, in this case, largely took over an entire city. And for that matter, to some degree, the entire state and maybe the region of the country in which they were strong. But they played on the hate and the fear and the envy and the jealousy of many of these whites who had felt that the country owed them something because they had fought in World War I. And here you have blacks who possibly didn't fight in World War I and were very prosperous. And you had the seeds for that kind of, of conflict economically. Now, socially, you had a different situation. Oklahoma is a very unique state in the sense that it's the only state in the Union that was settled the way it was. This was Indian Territory. It wasn't even a southern state in the Civil War. For that matter, it wasn't even a northern state. It was a state that was fought over by both sides. In fact, there were 69 battles fought in Oklahoma, largely between northern and southern Indians. But when the state was settled, it was settled by land runs. Benjamin Harrison opened up chunks of the state, and people just ran over this land and plotted out their portions. Now, why is that significant in terms of the riot? It's significant because an awful lot of those folks that made those land runs were Southerners whose farms and lands and plantations had been burned by Sherman and uh, the Union Army when they went through the South. They had no homes left, so they came west. And when they made those land runs, they brought in Southern culture with them. As a result, what you have here in Oklahoma is a microcosm of the United States. The northern half of the state is more metropolitan, in fact, politically, more Republican 
The northern half of the state was settled by farmers from Kansas, which was largely Union territory. The southern half of the state was largely settled by folks from the south. Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas. And the state pretty much splits that way in terms of politics and economics and social development. But when you add that extra economic jealousy and envy to it, the Ku Klux Klan had a breeding ground. And that's the reason they were able to hold parades that lasted four to five hours at a shot. There were an awful lot of people that were more than willing to hate blacks because they represented something they wished they had. Little Africa was possibly the most prosperous area that blacks have ever collectively developed any place in the world. Oklahoma was regarded as one of the cleanest states in the nation and cherished its reputation as being called God's country or the Bible Belt of America. Nothing could be further from the truth. Well, as I first stated, my husband predicted this that Sunday night at church. Them days we had BTUs. They about cut them out now and we don't have no BTU. But he made a public statement and told them that this was going to happen. But we didn't know. We hadn't seen no sign. But after church and after we went home, several men, young men and stuff, you know, they get all all shook up and everything. We had a good, a, a dear policeman at that time, uh, we called him uh, Barney Cleaver, Uncle Barney. He was down there trying to corral him because the trouble was arising and we didn't even know that with this black man and this white woman. And they down there showing out down to police station and all and and he was riding this big old horse, and he was telling them, you know, it wasn't going to be none of that. But they had guns and everything, and some of them come clear out as far as Latimer Street. That's where we lived. And running by that, men, get your guns. Get your guns. Blood running on Greenwood like water. My husband said, that's just a lie. That's what he said. Excuse the word. But he told me, he said, don't get disturbed about that. Say, they running along with them guns and shooting and going on and say in the morning when they need them, they're not going to have no ammunition and the white folks not going to let them have any. They won't give them nothing. So that's the way it started off with us. Well, naturally, women always get excited. And, uh, but we didn't have any children then, and my husband, he was a consolation for me. He's the one who saw the vision. I didn't see it, but he knew he had seen something coming. So he told me, said, Rosa, this is it. Send them, said, those men just clowning. Said they won't have a bullet to shoot in the morning, and the white people won't let them have none. So we went on to bed. And he said, you go to bed. I'm going down here and see what they're doing. He ran down on Greenwood. Come back, said they ain't doing nothing, just clowning. He talked about them down there with their guns in the hand. And, and policemen was trying to corral them. So he said, well, we'll go to bed. Said, but no telling what's going to happen. So we did. And he woke me up about daylight that morning. He said, we got to get up and go. The white people had put a machine gun on that big hill right up there and pointed down on all of us, all of us down in here. <laughs> and they was shooting like this, the, the bell, a gun, that way. One man that sold, walked and sold vegetables every day, I can't think of his name now, he was shot up there just a block from our house. What you see here is the very famous Mount Zion Baptist Church, a congregation that survived the 1921 riots 
and managed to rebuild on the exact same location where it was bombed and completely destroyed exactly 70 years ago. In 1921, a man's word was his bond. You measured the masculinity of a man by how much he kept his word. The congregation of the Mount Zion Baptist Church sticks in my mind because a year before the riot, the black congregation took out a 20-year mortgage and built this brand new church. And the Klan burned it to the ground. But instead of running out on their mortgage, instead of telling the bank, you're just going to have to take your losses. That congregation took out another 20-year mortgage and paid off both mortgages simultaneously. That's character. There were other heroes, too. Many of the whites in the southern part of the city had black employees. And those employees had become almost extensions of their family. In fact, a lot of Tulsans were raised by black domestic employees. And when the riot erupted, many of those families hid those blacks in their basement at great jeopardy to themselves because if the Klan had ever found out that a white had hidden a black in their basement, the white family would have been persecuted, if not horsewhipped. Probably the two most singular heroes out of the riot was the Tulsa County Sheriff and the Tulsa County Black Deputy Sheriff. Willard McCullough was the Tulsa County Sheriff at that time, and he was the only sheriff in the whole state that had black deputies. His chief black deputy was Barney Cleaver. And you got to keep in mind, when that riot erupted around the Tulsa County Courthouse, there weren't more than maybe a dozen deputies in that building. And Willard McCullough stood on the south steps of the Tulsa County Courthouse and told a mob of several thousand Ku Klux Klansmen who were heavily armed that he was not going to release Dick Rowland. Barney Cleaver stood on the north steps of the County Courthouse and told the black crowd that they weren't going to release Dick Rowland. Well, you put yourself in the position of a white county sheriff in a southern state in 1921, facing several thousand Ku Klux Klansmen, and you don't have more than maybe a dozen deputies to back you up. And Barney Cleaver's on the north side of the courthouse telling a black crowd the same thing. I don't know much about Barney Cleaver or Willard McCullough before or since then. But I can tell you this, on May 31st, 1921, they became, maybe earned the right, to become world-class cops. My husband told me, so we got to go. And I said, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to go out there. He said, yeah, you got to go. So you remember he had told the people he couldn't hardly get me out of the house. So I gave him a little argument about it, but I had to go. And I just had on my barefoot sandals and had a head rag on my head. And he said, let's go. We can't stay here. He said, we got to keep moving. So he got out there and he went to preaching to the people. See, we was very thickly settled in on both sides of the street. And all the houses was burnt down on, on my side. On, my, on this side and that side, but two houses, my house and another. All the rest of them was burned down. See, all those little people, every chance they got, they would stick fire to the house. And all that fire was burning, and folks was hollering, some of them and running. And my husband told them, said, don't run, so walk, and stay out in the opening where they'll see you. And so when nobody gets shot. So the w bunch we was with, they tried that, and we made it to the park. Where about noontime, the bells come to ringing and the horns and, and things. 
and somebody told us, said the militias are coming. And so T.R. told him, he said, walk out on the railroad. We took that Middle Valley Railroad going north and we walked to Mohawk Park. And that's where those people caught us. They was in trucks. It must have been some mighty, they was some mighty big trucks. And it was full of soldiers, and the soldiers all come come to us like this, come, come on us like this. The plan was extraordinarily powerful in Tulsa in 1921, but then again, it was extraordinarily powerful throughout Oklahoma. As a matter of fact, during the 20s, Oklahoma impeached and convicted two governors, allegedly, of course, for other charges, but uh, it was an open secret that one of the principal reasons they got impeached and convicted was that they were anti-Klan. Majority of the Oklahoma legislature were either Klansmen or supported by the Klan. But then Oklahoma was not unusual. States all across the country had that kind of influence in them. But in Tulsa County itself, there was a rather unique situation that developed. In the late teens, the Glenpool oil field was roaring. And that's just west of Tulsa County. An awful lot of money poured into this city. And the whites, who were the big oil men, lived on the east side of the Arkansas River. The roughnecks who worked the rigs lived on the west side. Well, there wasn't enough housing on the west side, so a lot of the roughnecks would come over to the east side and live in rooming houses on 12-hour shifts. A lot of people said that was due to the housing shortage. To a great degree, it had to do with the working cycle of a roughneck on a rig. His roughnecks worked 12-hour shifts on rigs. The point here is that a lot of the money that poured into Tulsa, that helped build Tulsa into the beautiful city it became, was also poured into the Ku Klux Klan. And the Klan became extraordinarily well-financed. With that sound financing that they received from those oil men who were sympathetic to the Klan and who were, in fact, effectively manipulating the lower white economic classes to their own benefit. The Klan in Tulsa had a lot of money to do a lot of things that other Klan claverns uh, didn't have that kind of support to do. For example, they had a building, a headquarters here in Tulsa. It was called Beano Hall. Now what did Beano stand for? It stood for Beano Jew, Beano Nigger, Beano Catholic. I think it's ironic that Beano Hall eventually evolved into a pig barn before it was finally torn down. The Ku Klux Klan was real big on uh, providing character guidance, attitude adjustment, and behavior modification on anybody they disagreed with. Not only including uh, blacks, but uh, whites who uh, they uh, regarded as uh, violating their standards. It wasn't uncommon for a white person, for example, who might have been uh, going out on his wife to be uh, hauled out of his house one night and tied to a tree and flogged by men dressed in uh, sheets. Many blacks, however, were lynched. They were lynched by such organizations as not only the Ku Klux Klan, but the Knights of the White Camellia. There were all kinds of super secret little organizations that were self-appointed vigilantes. As a matter of fact, the Justice Department itself created the American Protective League during World War I and uh, made it function under the FBI, which at that time was not the FBI we know today. It was a politicized FBI. But the American Protective League was uh, largely an organization of volunteer civilian white men 
designed to ferret out any uh, individuals of Germanic descent in Tulsa County and watch them to see if they uh, conducted any uh, espionage or pro-Kaiser activities during World War I. The American Protective League was formally disbanded after World War I, but that will give you an idea of the kind of mentality that existed then. But to address your question, yes, there were lynchings. And to give you an example, several weeks before the Tulsa riot, in Wagner, which is a small town east of Tulsa, a black man had been arrested on a minor charge and incarcerated in the Wagner County Jail. And that night, the sheriff or the guard or deputy, whoever was responsible for the jail, conveniently went out to get a sandwich, just as a crowd of uh, people dressed in white robes entered the jail took the man out, noose around his neck, wrapped the other end of the rope around the bumper of a Model T Ford and dragged him down the middle of Wagner, Main Street. And that sort of thing didn't just happen in Oklahoma. That sort of thing happened across the country. And there were many lynchings before the riot, and I'm sorry to say there were many lynchings after the riot but there weren't any lynchings in Tulsa County after the riot that I'm aware of. The men come and throwing away the guns, holes in the tracks. Every time I think about the men throwing them guns away, I laugh about them. As bad as it was, they were just throwing them away. They didn't want them white men to see them with no guns. So they, they about three or four trucks of them. All them soldiers, they fell out there. So we're not gonna hurt you, we're not gonna hurt you. And the men just throw them guns away and everything. Well, the next order they got was to bring some food out there, because we had left home without eating. And the first thing they brought out was just bare uh, boxes of milk and loaves of bread. And my husband got, got in line like he were, had some children. <laughs> he got him, got us two loaves and two quarts of milk. I've been telling everybody I didn't like sweet milk, but I drank sweet milk. <laughs> I drank sweet milk that morning with all these. And later on in the evening, they brought us another snack. Pork and beans was in the bunch, you might imagine. And then they got us word, all the women and children, they wanted to see us at a certain place. And we filled up there. They took all the women and children to this big place. I still can't remember where they took us. I know it was something like a, it was like a, like a fairground or something, a great big stadium. And I got scared there. I thought maybe they was going to put the men over there by themselves, which they did. But I thought they was going to kill them all. The interesting thing that happened during the riot was that the riot lasted almost all night of May 31st, 1921 and into the early morning hours of June 1st, 1921, before law enforcement authorities were able to get anything under control. The city police didn't want anything to do with trying to control the Ku Klux Klan. As a matter of fact, uh, the chief of police, a man by the name of Gustafson, confiscated black vehicles, gave them to two of his crony police officers on the Tulsa Police Force, which I might point out with some justification was a politicized police force at that time, not the police force that Tulsa has today, which is a first class department. But the point was in those days he gave those confiscated vehicles to those two police officers who went out and sold them to whites and then they shared the profit. Chief Gustafson was uh, later indicted for this and removed from public office in June of 1921. But there were many other indictments, too. And many of these indictments were the byproduct of National Guard boards of inquiry. Now, what happened in the riot, and this is fascinating, was that here you have a major war going on in, a, in the downtown portion of Tulsa. 
that erupted and moved north into the north part of the city, eventually wiping out the north part of the city, devastating it totally. And yet the mayor, none of the city commissioners, called the governor. Now at that time, we only had one 40-man ambulance company in the Oklahoma National Guard stationed in Tulsa. The governor at that time didn't know there was a riot in Tulsa until the next morning because no city or county official notified him, with the exception of the county sheriff. The county sheriff sent one of his black deputies through the north part of the city towards Sand Springs. He got to Sand Springs to a telegraph. And keeping in mind the telephone lines were down, the telegraph lines were down, the railroad tracks were torn up, there were Ku Klux Klansmen standing on roadblocks trying to catch uh, uh, blacks who are trying to escape the city, and there were refugees as far away as Kansas City and Wichita and, and uh, Muskogee, Oklahoma. That deputy got to that telegraph and telegraphed the governor on behalf of the county sheriff that there was a riot in Tulsa and law and order had broken down. J.B.A. Robertson, who was governor at the time, sent the adjutant general, who is the top military officer in the National Guard in Oklahoma, to Tulsa. The adjutant general arrived and immediately sized up the situation as being exactly what the governor had told, had been told by that deputy. And the adjutant general mobilized the Oklahoma National Guard and they sent in guard units from as far away as Enid and Lawton, Oklahoma City and Muskogee and places like that. And a lot of people attribute the troops that arrived were federal troops. They weren't federal troops. Federal troops were never deployed here. This was the Oklahoma National Guard that came in. Many of the survivors who I interviewed when they were still alive told me, frankly, the black survivors, they told me, frankly, they wouldn't have been alive that day if it hadn't been for Oklahoma National Guardsmen. Because the Guardsmen came in and the very first thing they did was declare martial law and threatened to shoot anybody who was found armed. They set up internment compounds to protect black refugees because black refugees were scattered all over the city. Their homes were burned. They had no place to go. And so they set up internment compounds around the city in various parks and places like this. But the next morning, the different white people was out there calling for their Negroes. <laughs> they maids and, and butlers and things. Because <laughs> my husband was, he was, he stood in good with his man. He worked at a rooming house. I said a rooming house that they, they called it then a sporting house. But that's where he worked. And uh, his, his, uh, the man he worked for was, it was the Ardmore Rooms on First Street where he worked. Well, that man, the owner of it, he come out there calling for T.R. Davis. And when he found T.R., then him and T.R. come over there where I was and got me in. We went on home. So, but I didn't tell you, one of my husband's best friends was killed that day. While we was in that rush, see, he told him not to run and don't get in close places, because they would just shoot in that bunch. This fellow was named Willie Lockett. He and my husband were great friends, and, and T.R. said to himself, where are you going, Willie? He said, I don't know, man, so I'm just going. And he was on a horse, and they said this was one of their favorite horses of the Lockett family. So T.I. told him to be careful and stay out in opening but he was killed that day. Every single insurance company that had a policy covering any kind of damage to homes or commercial businesses or industry cut and ran on their insurance policy because a, a riot wasn't included. The federal government and the state governments didn't have programs in place to uh, compensate citizens for being the victims of a breakdown of law and order. So effectively, the citizens who lived in 
Little Africa. Took the entire loss. The problem was that when we're talking entire loss, we're talking everything. There was no FDIC then. They might have had their money in a bank, and if the bank was burned and the money stolen, there was no way to recoup it. Jewelry stores in Little, little Africa were stripped clean. Uh, furniture was taken out of homes. Everything was gone and the homes were burned to the ground. So when we're talking about refugees, we're talking about refugees that had nothing left except what they carried on their back. Yes, uh, it was a good friend of mine. <coughs> she and her husband, gave, they gave birth to a little baby that night. And, you know, I guess they didn't have nothing to put it in because there was no conveniences. <coughs> They put it in a shoebox, newborn baby. And, but some people, you know, some people that day, you couldn't stop them from running. We had to walk, because that was our safest way. But these people were running, and it seemed as though that they set this box down where this baby was and to rest, because people got awfully tired, and they couldn't find it. It was stillborn, already dead. But they didn't want to throw it away. They wanted to take it home and then have a film. But they didn't get to. And there were so many things that taking place that day, that we lost our our best doctor the next morning. But they told me that he had, oh, he stood somewhere there in one of those buildings down by the, where there lived three corner places on Greenwood. You know, it's the ruined house on that side and you know, something like that on this side and in the brickyard. Well, they said he stood along there and he, he just mowed quite a few of them down. There were witnesses that an airplane crossed the black community by air and something was thrown out of it. There were explosions. The problem is that you don't have a cause and effect direct relationship because Tulsa was piped by natural gas in those days as it is today. And many of the homes were already burning. So from a more precise perspective, there isn't hard proof that a plane came over the black community and dropped bombs on the black community. However, there have been a couple of things we've been able to establish. There was a plane over the black community. There were things thrown out of it. There are some interesting conclusions you can reach from some available evidence. First, it wasn't a government plane. There were only about a half dozen planes in the state at that time that belonged to the government. There was no Air Force then. The National Guard didn't exist. And there were about a half a dozen biplanes at Fort Sill. None of them took off the ground during this period. But this was the period of barnstormers. It wasn't uncommon for a pilot who learned how to fly in World War I to have a biplane and to fly around the country and do tricks at state fairs and maybe uh, take somebody up for a couple of dollars. That, in all likelihood, was what happened then, that a barnstormer who had his own airplane actually flew over the black community. Now, if he threw out anything, and if it was a bomb, perfectly understandable how it could have worked because it doesn't take very much to make a bomb particularly if you're a veteran of a recent war that had just ended Greenwood was soon labeled the Black Wall Street of America it consisted of highly educated black doctors lawyers PhDs merchants 
all men and entrepreneurs. The interesting thing about uh, this particular situation is that in North Tulsa in 1921, prior to the riot, there existed an area called Little Africa. And that was a mark of respect. The black business community was extraordinarily prosperous. As a matter of fact, possibly the best mines in black America had migrated to North Tulsa in the late teens and early 20s. They built a commercial and business establishment so prosperous that it rivaled any place in the world. In fact, the main street of Little Africa, Greenwood, was euphemistically referred to as the Black Wall Street. They were millionaires that lived there, and some of the architecture of some of the old homes in North Tulsa today represent that particular period.